And I should also add that if any point you have any questions or comments, um, you're welcome to put them in the chat. Uh, so next slide, Tess. So what is our site? Our site, as I said, is a website built by Women with Disabilities Australia, um, what we call WIDA, just because it's easier. Um, so if we're saying WIDA, that's what we mean. Um, our site was built in true co-design with women and non-binary people with disabilities across Australia. Our site provides engaging and practical information and resources in a range of different formats to support women, girls and non-binary people with disability to learn about and stand up for their rights. Our site was created because women, girls and non-binary people with disability asked for it. Um, for many years, the community of women with disability in Australia told us that there was a lack of high quality information available that is accessible and relevant to issues affecting their daily lives. Um, and in addition, we've found that it has been very helpful for people to learn about their rights under international human rights instruments. Um, so things like the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities and the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Um, because it provides this information in an accessible and easy to understand way. Uh, so next slide. Um, the information in our site is divided into five priority areas. These areas were selected by women, girls and non-binary people with disabilities themselves. Um, the first section is your rights, which provides information on the human rights of women, girls and non-binary people with disability, including United Nations conventions, as I mentioned, as well as Australian and state-based laws. It also provides information on police, courts, prisons, discrimination, how to make a complaint and more. The lead and take part section is the section, second section, and this was based on an original title of leadership and participation. And this section provides information about being a leader and taking part in every aspect of the community. This includes information on work, education, hobbies, mentoring, boards and committees, leadership organizations, and more. The third section is um, life choices, um, which is one that not everyone understands at first. So it comes from an original title, which was decision-making um, agency and lifestyle. So the life choices section provides information that supports your rights to make your own choices and decisions in everyday life. This includes decisions about money, housing, healthcare, and lifestyle. This section also provides information on preparing for national disasters and emergencies and currently has a page dedicated dedicated to COVID-19, um, the current pandemic. The fourth section, Sex in Your Body, which was based on the original title, Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights, provides information about your right to express your gender and sexuality, to have relationships and to raise a family. It also contains information on sex, consent, contraception, body image and women's health, which we know for many women with disabilities um, is often non-existent in accessible formats in their lives in other ways. Um, and the final section is safety and violence. And this section provides information on your right to be free from all forms of violence. This includes information on different types of violence, how to get support if you need it, and also how you how people can participate in um, consultations and national forums. So at the moment, um, Australia has a national inquiry into violence against people with disability called the Disability Royal Commission. Um, and we've got information about that in this section to try and encourage women and girls with disability to take part. Um, within each section on our site there are a lot of different pages which cover all of these different topics that I mentioned. Once you go into one of these pages you'll find lots of information as well as downloadable resources, videos, images and links 
Um, and the downloadable resources are things that are both external, so that we have not created ourselves, as well as things that we have created based on um, specific needs that have been identified. So things like fact sheets on how to advocate for your rights or how to make a complaint. Um, next slide. So the Outsight website also has an easy read version. So the entire website can be viewed in easy read, which for those of you that don't know, essentially is um, writing in much simpler formats accompanied by a picture uh, and is usually used by people with intellectual disability, low literacy, or people whose first language is not English. Um, easy read uses simple and under simple and easy to understand language and images and yeah it can be useful for many communities and next slide and now i'm going to pass over to my colleague marley who's going to talk about the translations section thanks heidi um yes my name is marley i am a policy and project officer at WIDA. for any visually impaired folks i have um, mid blank dark brown hair fair skin, I'm wearing some clear framed glasses, and then I have a wonderful colourful background with some different women with disabilities featured or illustrated um, that was made as a part of one of Witter's other projects called Witter Lead. Um, but yeah, so beyond just the easy English translations, um, Witter knew that it was really important to be able to engage with communities who don't speak English as a first language, um, particularly because we know that a lot of migrant and refugee women, for instance, um, have disabilities or have acquired disabilities. Um, and we also have um, a really large First Nations community in Australia as well of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So a lot of the resources and web pages on the site website were translated into Auslan, which is Australian Sign Language. And so that includes um, some video translations with some Auslan interpreters signing some of the information, as well as other languages such as Arabic and a lot of First Nations languages as well. Um, and so we found that those translations have been really useful for, in particular, lots of different um, community controlled health organisations across Australia who maybe don't have the resourcing or time to be creating disability specific information. Um, yeah, Tess, if you could go to the next slide. So I think the one of the most relatable and popular parts of our site is the real story section. So um, in the spirit of co-design, the Witter team knew that it was really important to not just, I guess, dump information on people, but to have a platform for women and gender diverse people with disabilities to share their stories. So um, anyone who visits the site can actually contextualize a lot of this information. Um, and so that a lot of the participants who created our site um, can feel empowered to tell their stories. So this section provides written, video and audio stories from over 40 women with disabilities across Australia. And as I said, it has absolutely proved to be one of the most popular parts of the website. So in their stories, women share their personal experiences, providing relatable and real life insights into a lot of the concepts on the pages that Heidi has explained. And since the development of our site, we have continued to update this section. Um, so this is one of the sections that gets updated most regularly because um, when folks see these stories, I think it empowers them to want to tell their own story, which is wonderful. So we have posted a few new stories um, and we've also established a Witter blog as well. So I will link that in the chat for anyone um, who's interested in reading more stories from women with disabilities and other gender diverse people with disabilities across Australia. Um, Heidi, I will pass back to you. Yep, so um, I'm just going to talk a bit about who created our site and what that process involved, which is essentially the nature of co-design that we've been talking about. Um, so 
for the creation of our site, Witter engaged over 100 women, um, girls and non-binary people with disability. Um, Witter made sure that women and non-binary people with disability were involved in every stage of the project. Um, and this is, yeah, the nature of the co-design approach, um, as I mentioned. Um, the Our Site website is different. Um, we find that a lot of, I guess, consultation and what is often called co-design, but is not, uh, processes kind of involve people at one stage of development and take their advice or feedback and use it or not. Um, but with our site, we involve people right from the beginning to the end. Um, the project was led and governed by women and non-binary people with disability, um, both within WIDA and outside of it, um, through a number of committees, such as um, a project steering committee, um, and expert advisory panel and more. Um, in total, as I mentioned, over 100 women and non-binary people with disability were involved. And yeah, it was throughout every stage. So as I mentioned earlier, our site was created because people asked for it. So women and girls with disability were involved right from the beginning of the project um, conceptualization. And this largely came about through a national forum that WIDA held in 2016 um, with many of its members. At that point in time, it was held in person because we were lucky enough to do so. Um, and at that stage, um, women and girls with disability who attended the forum identified that they wanted a virtual sort of one-stop shop that contained information about their rights and in particular inf information about areas that um, was often missing. So safety and violence and sexual and reproductive rights were two of those key areas. Once the outside project got started and that happened through getting funding from our federal government, um, women with disability were again involved from the beginning. So we just set up, set up a project steering committee made up of, um, a large and diverse group of women and non-binary people with disability with various expertise um, to advise on and drive the project. We then set up an expert advisory panel, which was made up of over 40 women and non-binary people with disability who had expertise in various areas related to the content of the website. So some people, for example, advised on the safety and violence section, while other people advised on the your rights section, um, while others advised more on things like the technicalities of the accessibility of the website um, and how to ensure that the website was accessible to all people with disability. Um, in addition to that, we ran workshops. So there was six, six workshops across Australia with different groups of women and non-binary people with disability. And we tried to capture a large um, range of cohorts in those uh, consultations. So, for example, one group was made up of <clears throat> women with intellectual disability who had experienced violence. Another group was made up of entirely um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women and non-binary people who um, lived in a very rural town in Australia, while other groups were made up of a broad range of women and non-binary people with disability, um, with all types of disabilities and experiences. Um, people who were involved, so the expert panel and workshop participants were also encouraged to participate in user testing activities. So that involved at various stages of the website development, we would send them a website link with a password where they could log in, have a look, have a try of the different aspects of the site and give us feedback. And then we would address that feedback. And then there was finally a quality review panel, which uh, essentially advised right at the end on um, signing off on the content, making sure everything was up to standard and address the needs of our community. So next slide. Um, the feedback, and this was largely through the workshops, but also through um, consultations in general, told us that 
our community wanted a website that was easy to use and read. So one specific piece of feedback um, that comes to mind is that people said they didn't want lots of busyness. So there needed to be a white background with not too much text, um, a few pictures here and there, but not so much that they felt overwhelmed by it. Um, lots of stories that they could relate to, um, not just information, as Marley said. So information about various topics, but then linked to stories from women with disability themselves who had had those experiences. Um, guides and checklists on various topics, information on sensitive topics like sex and violence, which were often considered taboo in various communities or were not discussed um, in certain contexts. For example, for women living in institutional settings who had often never been given any information about sex or violence. Um, Self-advocacy tools, information on services and supporters and ways to connect with other women, which we did through creating a community Facebook page that's linked to the site. Um, a community Facebook group, sorry, that people can join and discuss with other members. So next slide. Um, and the other thing is um, through the co-design process, it not only benefited our project, so it made our website relevant and useful to the community we were creating it for, but many people who participated said they actually also gained huge benefits. So here's some things that some of the participants said. For the first time in a long time, I felt free, free from the feeling I had to hide my disability, free from feeling judged. This increased my confidence and it brought me joy. Um, there has definitely been an increase in confidence within myself as a woman and as an advocate. Being part of this project enabled me to be more courageous and step up by sharing my story on video, helping me to accept the pain and violence I've experienced and how I can use my challenges to be my strength. The fact that the input was all from women with disability made me feel that the content was authentic. Uh, so next slide. And now what we're going to do is hear from some of the people that were involved in the co-design. So not as staff, but as participants. And first I'm going to introduce um, someone that is now my colleague, but was then uh, at that time not. Um, so Tess started off as an expert panel member on the Outside Project with WIDA and a story contributor, and now is a WIDA staff member. So I'll just introduce Tess. Tess is a proud non-binary queer person with disability who is a carer, parent, carer and parent of multiple family members with a disability and a victim survivor of multiple forms of violence. Tess is a passionate intersectional advocate with a particular focus in prevention of, in the prevention of family, domestic and sexual violence in the disability and LGBTIQA plus community. Tess works at WIDA as a policy and project officer, predominantly working on the Disability Royal Commission and our National Women's Alliance work. They participate in various advisory groups, including the National Plan Advisory Group, Minister for Disability Consultative Group, ACON Queer Ability Advisory Group, UTS Advisory Research for Autistic Girls and Women, ACON's National Primary Prevention Advisory Group, have previously sat on the board of Autism Tasmania and in Gender Equality, and worked as an LGBTIQ plus community worker for Working It Out Tasmania. Alongside working at WIDA, Tess also works as a project coordinator for In Gender Equality, where they coordinate and support women who are victim survivors of family and sexual violence to engage in media, public speaking and legislative change. Tess is also studying a master's in forensic behavioral, behavioral science with Swinburne University and in their spare time, loves spending time with family and venturing into the forest. So welcome Tess. Hi everyone, I'm Tess, my pronouns are they, them, and like Heidi said, I work at WIDA as a policy and project officer. 
Um, for those of you who are visually impaired in the room, um, I have got long black hair with a blue fringe and I've got light pink framed glasses. Um, I have olive skin and brown eyes and I have a banner um, behind me which is a picture of the Women with Disabilities Australia logo with the words Women with Disabilities Australia next to it, purple text on a black background. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Pierrapa people today in Luktrawita, which is Tasmania. I'm tucked up in the very far northwest corner. Um, I live in some farming land and it's beautiful land. So I was involved in the development of our site as an expert panel member, along with a group of other women, feminine identifying and non-binary people with disability. But I was more specifically involved in the safety and violence section of the website because that's the issue that I'm the most passionate about and the most experienced in. So I'm also a victim survivor of gender-based violence. Um, the opportunity to be involved with our site came up at a really interesting time for me. I had just been pretty newly diagnosed with multiple health conditions um, and disability. And at the time I was still processing the changes to my life that this created, along with working through accepting my identity as a person with disability. Um, I was diagnosed with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, um, autistic um, and having ADHD all within a short period of time, along with over a dozen other chronic health conditions in the lead up to this. Um, and at the very same time, my child was being diagnosed with multiple forms of disability at the same time too. Um, I felt like everything that I had sort of known about myself and life had been really thrown into a bit of disarray. I'd left work to manage my health um, and well-being for myself and my child, but I was really quite lost in working out what it all meant for me moving forward. Um, I initially, I'd been really active um, and always worked full time prior to my diagnosis. And I realised um, that I initially had a lot of internalised ableism, which made me terrified about what having a disability and caring for a child with disability meant for me and what it would mean for my future. So, like I said, I guess you could say I was a little bit lost at that point in time. So in navigating um, that journey, I started looking for ways to connect with my disability community, um, women with disability and other queer people with disability, predominantly online because I live in a rural and remote area and didn't have the ability to um, travel too far to do that. The closest, largest city to where I live is about three and a half hours drive one way. So. I was looking to connect online to find those people. So I looked for opportunities to have conversations with other people that could validate my experience, guide me, support me to work through things. And this was when I came across WIDA, um, joined up as a member and started looking at their website and following the work that they were doing. And eventually the opportunity to be involved in our site came up for me. Um, both as an expert panel member, but also as a story contributor as well. Being part of the co-design for our site was really positive and empowering for me in so many ways. Um, it enabled me to connect with other women and non-binary people with disability, which provided a real sense of community and validation um, for me. Uh, it was really obvious that we were all really passionate about making things better for people with disability. And as we came together on that panel, I felt really honoured and bolstered by that sense of solidarity and shared purpose that we had there. I felt like that I was no longer just alone in the world and I could use my own lived experience to really authentically make an impact for other women with disabilities. Sharing my story uh, my individual story on our site as well enabled me to dip my toe in around being out and proud about being disabled um, and I was able to do that in a su supported space um, with other women with disability so that sort of that really 
boosted my confidence to start speaking out about disability rights. I used to think that my experience of violence and abuse was just a story I had to tell, you know, incidentally in conversations. But as I started to be involved in co-design, I realised that it could be used in other ways to bring change. And I realised that my lived experience wasn't only just was not only valid, but I could use it in powerful ways to help others and inform development of resources for women and girls with disability. Um, in the past, I myself, um, when I was experiencing violence or abuse, struggled to find resources that were relevant and helpful for me. So I felt really excited that I could be part of doing that for other women and girls with disability. Um, also in the past, I've volunteered a little bit for other organisations in co-design or research or consultancy, but it was all unpaid, it was all volunteered. And um, working on the, the website with WIDA, this was the first time that I'd actually been paid for any form of co-design. So that was new to me. And I remember thinking, wow, people pay for lived experience. It's not just all about needing a uni degree to justify my knowledge or, or place value in what I had to share. Um, I found each time I went to the mailbox and had a gift card for my involvement, I smiled to myself because I felt so valued around what, what I contributed um, and also that value in speaking to my own experience. I think that uh, lived experience um, is important in co-design for a couple of reasons. Um, the first one is that we are the people that have used the services and looked for the information and supports and we have that experience around what we need and what works or more importantly what doesn't help. Um, resources and supports that are created based on what people or organisations think that we need always run that risk of falling short um, and not being accessible or relevant to us. So co-design makes resources and services fit for purpose instead of just a generic version that isn't really worth the paper that it's written on or some tokenistic effort to provide support, which we, we can often see. Um, not only is our experience valid in the development of the resources, but also our co-design can be used to inform policy and practice, so going to that next level. Um, number two is co-design brings accountability to an organisation who's developing the resources and supports. Um, accountability as far as being inclusive, accessible, but nuanced in an organisation's work as well. But it also ensures that a human rights and intersectional lens is applied in everything that they do. The other thing is that co-design ensures an inclusive practice where diverse voices can be heard. Um, and it ensures that the complexities of being from multiple areas of um, intersectionality, such as being First Nations, queer, disabled, living in a rural remote area, all of those things which I am, um, or from a low socioeconomic background, they can all be considered and supported appropriately and effectively because not one resource fits all. Uh, the last point is, um, it provides opportunities to develop skills and confidence and experience that are relevant and transferable to paid employment and other opportunities. And it does so in a supported and mentored way. So in, in my case, like Heidi mentioned before, I went from working on the panel at the Our Smart website to now I'm employed at WIDA uh, three, three years, I think it is later. So I, I think it in it provides important, um, I guess, development of skills and confidence to be able to move forward and do that as well. So yeah, that's me and my wonderful positive experience of being part of that panel. Um, I'd like to introduce Aki um, now, but I might actually hand to you Heidi because I don't have the notes to introduce Aki in the slides that I've got. So I might have to hand back to you. I just realised I didn't have those. Yeah, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so now we're going to hear from Aki, who is uh, was also involved in the Our Site co-design process as an expert panel member, quality review panel member, as well as an Our Site story contributor. Um, Aki 
like Tess, has continued to be involved with WIDA in different ways, um, including through other projects such as WIDA's uh, lead, lead Project Steering Committee, which is um, a project based on building the leadership and capacity of women and girls, and Toolkit Co-Design Committee. Um, so Aki is a disability leader and internationally awarded multi sorry, and multi-award winning gender equity fierce advocate, passionate about disability rights and representation. They are a proud young, disabled, chronically ill, non-binary, femme and queer person of colour from a refugee background. Aki is a first generation of Australian, born and raised in Australia from Vietnam. Um, from Vietnam war refugee parents who arrived in Australia by boat. Aki lives with numerous complex chronic illnesses, chronic pain and disability and is a survivor advocate of both intimate partner violence and family violence. Aki consults on and is deeply passionate about intersectionality, non-tokenistic representation, LGBTIQA plus rights, gender equity, diversity, co-design, accessibility and inclusion. Aki is also an agency represented and internationally published model, working to challenge the often negative stigmas and perception of queer, gender diverse and disabled people within the media, fashion and beauty industries. So welcome Aki. Thank you Heidi uh, for that lovely introduction. Um, hi everyone, my name is Aki. Um, Hello to everyone from around the world. As Heidi mentioned, I'm a first generation Australian. I was born in Australia from Vietnam War refugee parents who traveled by a boat to Australia after living for several years in refugee camps. In fact, my mother was pregnant with my oldest brother while traveling here. So they'd gone through quite a, a bit of a journey to get to Australia. Um, I reside in Nam or Melbourne, Victoria, and I want to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land on which I am streaming from, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. So hello to everyone on the call at the moment and everyone who will access the recording at a later date. Um, to anyone who is blind or has low vision, I am an Asian person. I have blue, pink and purple hair that is clipped back into a small bun. I'm wearing a light pink t-shirt um, with the Aboriginal flag colours that say always was and always will be. And I'm wearing a necklace and pearl earrings. And um, I have a virtual background, which is the Our Site logo background, which you will find on Our Site. Um, so just a little bit about me. I live with numerous disabilities and chronic illness, which include a spinal injury, a systemic connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and a whole host of other conditions which result in chronic pain, limited mobility, and at times life-threatening situations like spontaneous anaphylaxis. I was also born with a life-threatening condition called necrotizing enterocolitis and have been chronically ill and lived with disability throughout my whole life. I apologize for that noise. That is my dog wanting my attention. So apologies for that. Um, I have, sorry, so I've been chronically ill my whole life. And I've more recently, I've spent months in hospital surviving four bouts of sepsis and relearning to kind of walk again as a result of severe neurological issues um, because of multiple ICU stays, code blues and near death experience. And has have recently been diagnosed with functional neurological disorder as well as other neurological issues relating to all of my resuscitations. Anyways, um, <laughs> I am the sustainability and impact manager at Disability Sport and Recreation. I manage a team helping to promote equal opportunities for people with disability to be active and undertake sport or recreation that is meaningful to them. I'm also a researcher assistant working on a project about stigma for people who identify as women marginalized by mental illness, disability and refugee status. I also work as an international presenter, keynote speaker and consultation in disability, diversity and accessibility, particularly for people of colour and those that relate directly to my intersections. So those who are queer, non-binary and come from non-English speaking refugee backgrounds. Um, as mentioned, my pronouns are they, them. I am a proud queer, non-binary person of colour with disability. And I was involved in our site um, 
in numerous aspects of our site, essentially every single one of them in some way, um, uh, including as a story contributor, contributor where I shared my own lived experience as a survivor of intimate partner oh. violence and family violence and the intersections of a person from a refugee background and the challenges of the intergenerational trauma and identity as a person of color, particularly from an Asian background and my identity with disability relating to that. So firstly, um, I was involved in our site as an expert advisory panel member as a result of my lifetime of lived experience as someone who um, is disabled, as well as my professional background and expertise in community development and health promotion and disability advocacy, and my very, very deep passion for gender equity and prevention of violence, particularly against girls, women, feminine identifying and non-binary people with disability. Uh, I was involved in many areas of our site, but my main um, expert area, I guess, was safety from all forms of violence because I myself am a survivor advocate of intimate partner and family violence. In fact, my spinal injury and the chronic pain as a result of my spinal injury is the reason, sorry, and the reason why I live with severe chronic disabling pain and use a wheelchair is, is because of direct result of intimate partner violence. Um, as well as my chronic PTSD and various other psychosocial disabilities and trauma uh, as a result of intergenerational trauma and family violence. So through being an expert panel member, I was able to provide consultation, feedback, and as well as personal and professional opinions through both a lived experience and professional lens. I provided feedback on all sorts of um, aspects of our site from, I guess, the imagery, the way it looks and feels to the resources, the flow, the content and the way it connected and functioned with members of our community. I shared how we could create change about languages throughout the site and um, ensure that we are inclusive and diverse. And I, I guess I shared and spoke from my own lived experiences, particularly from a cultural perspective to ensure like the images have a range of different people um, and like in perception wise of uh, like people of color, different types of people of color, different types of disability, different types of mobility aid, mobility aids and things like that, as well as people that may not look um, like they have a disability because of invisible or hidden disabilities. Um, I also shared, um, sorry, yeah, so to ensure that the site itself was intersectional and accessible and that it was sustainable. I also agreed to share my personal story as an outside lived experience story contributor. It was actually the first time I had publicly shared my own lived experience of what happened to me as a victim survivor of both intimate partner and family violence. Um, prior to, I guess, recording myself for outside, I'd never really shared it before ever publicly and like spoken the words out loud. Um, so I think that was really, empowering but also really scary because you know there's so many um barriers to being believed and supported um particularly if you're in a relationship with the person who was violent towards you and you stayed in that relationship and people ask all sorts of questions about why you didn't leave and we all know that it's not that simple so um yeah so it was my first time sharing about it. And as I mentioned previously, I shared um, not only my experiences of violence, but also my identity with disability from an Asian background and the <laughs> often insidious, not even, yeah, like insidious um, ableism that is a very big part of Asian culture. Um, and there's no such thing as being proud and disabled. Um, and things like mental health and mental illness just don't exist because if you are particularly from a refugee background um, or a low socioeconomic or poor background, having food on the table and a roof over your head is something you should be grateful for. So any additional challenges or stresses in your life that contribute to it not being the best it can be is you being ungrateful. So um, that is something that I spoke about in my contribution as well. And I guess it was, it was a really great 
turning point for me to be able to be proud of who I am and my identity as a disabled person, but also acknowledging that a lot of what I went through isn't and wasn't my fault. And I'd worked in disability, sorry, I'd worked in violence prevention for a number of years prior to doing this, but I'd never really had the courage to speak up and talk about what actually happened to me. So yeah, I guess a lot of what I shared was something I always wanted to do, but never really felt the courage to. And I was given the opportunity to through our site. Um, so initially feeling really anxious about sharing, I knew it was something I really wanted to do for myself, but I also knew that I could contribute to what I was really deeply passionate about and that I could encourage women with disabilities or other marginalized genders to share their stories, to seek help and to know that they are not alone. Um, for, for others to know that there are people and organizations like WIDA out there working tireless, tirelessly to advocate for and link to the services that can support and help. And as cliche as it may seem, um, I wanted and continue to work hard to be the change that I want in the world because I, I thought to myself how could I work within my industry as a public health professional working in violence prevention and disability and be too scared to share my own story and I wanted to show that it's okay to share your story and that it's, it's okay to be scared but most importantly it's okay to ask for help so yeah I guess I just wanted I was given I wanted to but was given the opportunity through co-design and through WIDA um, to inspire others to know that they aren't to plan they aren't to blame and they aren't alone and there is strength within being vulnerable and within sharing your story whenever you feel ready, of course. Um, and yeah, it was incredibly uh, empowering being able to share even a fraction of what I went through after years upon years upon years of rep repressing it, um, feelings of shame and dealing with the trauma of it was just the way that I personally it was a way that I personally allowed myself to let go of my internalized blame for what happened to me, as well as my internalized ableism. Um, so I am thankful to WIDA and our site for not only the encouragement, but genuinely for all the support they provided me to be able to be a story contributor and share my experiences. I actually went down, I live in Melbourne, Victoria, Nam, and I went down to Tasmania in um, the offices um, to film my part um so they facilitated all of that to happen which i'm grateful for because it was my first time going to tasmania and i had a little um time out uh, there to enjoy um the beauty of tasmania as well um so yeah i hope that sharing my story on our site and my experiences here today um helps other people now and into the future and lastly i was involved as a quality review panel member um, in addition to the hundreds of women, girls and non-binary people with disability across Australia and WIDA involved in the development of our site, which of course I thought was, incredi was incredible, um, literally making the site our site, um, uh, enabling the community to feel connection. It enabled a community to, to have connection and buy-in or personal ownership. Um, it, the quality review committee was from a dozen of these people and I was one of them. And it was, I guess, being able to provide feedback on the finishing final touches of our site before it was officially launched at the Australian Human Rights Commission, where I was invited to be there in person to celebrate the momentous occasion and all the hard work that everyone, particularly Heidi, um, put into the, um, the our site to make it reality. So anyways, I feel like I've talked a lot. I apologize for that. Um, in summary, um, our co-design and involving members of our community, the community that you are supporting is absolutely the most crucial thing that you can do. You can't do something for someone or a community and expect them to care about it without including them. Involving people that it's going to impact most is essentially the biggest and most crucial way of ensuring change and buy-in. And I'm living proof of that. Since our site, I've been involved in almost every WIDA project in existence. I've also been an extremely active and passionate member of WIDA and look forward to continuing to provide my lived experience, expertise, consultation, and connect even more with members of my community through the incredible work that WIDA does. Our site um, was one of the first times that I was using my professional as well as lived experience to make a difference. 
and I learned that my voice matters. And now I've been a have been more confident in myself and my ability to contribute to contribute to the world. Since then, I've been paid and invited to speak at forums all around the world and throughout Australia, um, on just not just outside, but everything, because I found the confidence in myself um, and the fact that I can and do contribute positively. Um, so yeah, thank you to Heidi, Marley, Tess, and the entire Witter team for the opportunities and how much you've empowered and supported so many people with disabilities, particularly girls, women, feminine identifying and non-binary people with disability across Australia to be involved in all the great work that you do. And thank you everyone today for providing me with a platform to share a little bit about my story and the experience of our site and co-design. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aki. And I think I can very positively say that we're very grateful for you sharing your story as well as you, Tess, as well, um, acknowledging that yeah, these are not easy things to talk about. Um, and so, yeah, it's really deeply appreciated <clears throat> to share your own experiences of disability and um, in particular violence as well. So thank you for always trusting Widder. We really appreciate it. And yeah, we are so lucky to be guided by your voice and um, your voice as well, Tess. Um, yes, I did not acknowledge the country that I am on, so I quickly wanted to acknowledge that I am joining today's presentation from Mianjin, which is otherwise known as Brisbane, on unceded Yagara and Turubu lands. Um, so for folks overseas, I know that it's becoming common practice to acknowledge First Nations lands that you're located to. Um, but here in Australia, we always like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander country that we're joining from, acknowledging that, yeah, this is stolen land that we are all meeting from today. So tips on co-design. Um, so I linked in the chat the final report that kind of outlined the our site project in whole. So you'll find all of those tips in here if you want to download that and refer back to these. And we'll also send through a copy of today's recording and presentation when we have it. But um, yeah, based on our experience with our site, um, one of the most important things is to have a really strong project governance and a really clear plan for involving women and non-binary people with disability at all levels and all stages of the project. Um, so I like to use the analogy that, you know, it's no good having a kitchen table, cooking up a really nice meal and then taking people the leftovers. People need to be at the kitchen table from the start. Um, and so that means that people with disabilities, in particular women with disabilities, need to be a part of the co-design process from inception right up until evaluation, um, not just, you know, consulted here or there. Another really um, strong tip is to reach out to other groups and organisations to proactively recruit a diverse group of people, such as in the Australian context, that included Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, whatever country you're in, First Nations people or Indigenous people, um, LGBTIQA plus people with disability, as well as people with disability who are living in segregated settings and often you know don't have their voices included in these projects so women with disabilities who have been criminalized and incarcerated in prisons um, women with disabilities living in group homes for example um, as Aki and Tess have both really emphasized pay co-design participants for their time and I think in paying co-design participants for their time you're sending a really strong message that not only do you value their insight and knowledge, but that their insight and knowledge is legitimate. You know, often as women with disabilities, people ask us for free labor all the time. And I think they feel okay doing that because it's assumed that whatever advice or knowledge we provide isn't actually of use or value. So remunerating people is a really big one. So yeah, before even starting to um, design a project, have a budget and actually budget for paying all your co-design participants. And if you can't do that, then maybe you need to scale down the project. Um, offer a really wide range of different engagement mechanisms to support varied levels of involvement um, and also to support people's different accessibility needs. So everybody 
will have a favourite way or a most accessible way to participate in a project. Um, and by changing the frequency and the type of task that you're asking someone to be involved in, it helps to ensure that you have a broader range of people actually contributing to the project. So for our site, for example, we held online meetings, we had face-to-face -face workshops, we had surveys, um, there were opportunities for people to contribute in writing via email. Um, and then there were also individualized support and engagement mechanisms when needed. So by balancing these different tasks, as well as with different frequencies. So for instance, you know, there were more frequent engagement opportunities requiring shorter periods of focus or intensity. Um, yeah, it allowed, I think, more voices to come through. Um, another tip is to communicate engagement instructions using multiple mechanisms. So not only verbally, but also written instructions as well. Um, so, you know, I know this for myself and my own access needs. If somebody sends me a really big email with lots of instructions and they then join a meeting, I very much appreciate them, uh, I guess, reverbalizing and going through those instructions again. So I think it was all about, um, yeah, communicating with people in a really slow and intentional way um, and making sure that information was communicated in whatever language or format that people needed. Um, another tip would be to schedule consultations well in advance and allow for sufficient time for input. Um, and then finally, seek feedback from your co-design participants, not just at the end in the evaluation process, but all the way through the implementation of the project. So that means that you can make improvements throughout the project and actually maybe address anything that's going wrong rather than um, waiting till the end. So we don't have much time left, but I know that we have a really big audience. So I wanted to ask if anyone had any questions. And I might hand over to Heidi, who is more than happy to ask as Heidi was, yeah, one of the main leads on the Brilliant Outside project. So Heidi, I might pass over to you. And yeah. uh, people feel free to put your hand up visually to um, use the raise hand reaction or even just to ask a question in the chat as well. Yep, thanks, Molly. Um, happy to take questions, offer anyone to address them to anyone that's spoken today, not just me. Um, but yeah, we might just take two or three just because of timing. Um, if anyone has any, just speak up or put your hand up or put them in the chat. Um, I, I just, oops, sorry. Sorry, this is Jen Kirkland. I had a question for Molly. Uh, it's not specific to um, a diversity and making sure that everyone is present, but we have done some code design uh, projects in our organization, and we we've seen to have a problem with um, keeping people engaged. So we we might get twenty people at the beginning of a project. Uh, it's definitely volunteer work. So by the end of the project, we're seeing maybe only two or three who make it all the way to the end and we can really count on being there for the end product. So I was wondering if you had any tips or tricks for that. Yeah, that's a very fair question. Um, I think maybe a tip would be to ask people, um, and it can be hard too, because often people, you know, feel a little bit awkward about answering really upfront questions, but maybe asking people upfront, you know, like what is preventing you from participating? For instance, is it purely a time thing? Um, is it maybe there isn't enough social buy-in as well? So I know with different co-design processes, it can help to organise, I guess, social connection as well. And I think maybe Tess or Aki can speak to this a bit more. Um, but some of the really beautiful parts of a lot of the WIDA co-design processes is that it's created little communities um, of different advisory groups as well. So maybe considering, you know, do you want to schedule in a little social chat or um, a Zoom call for all the participants just to catch up as well. And so that way um, people feel as if they're, yeah, becoming part of a community 
um, and I think maybe have a, a greater sense of um, attachment or accountability to the project. But um, Tess or Aki or Hardy, did you have any tips in regard to this? Yeah, just I, I know that it's not always possible, but um, voluntary things are hard to engage people because obviously it's expensive being disabled um, and we don't always have lots of time. Um, and so we would prioritise things that are paid just for the fact that we are already like being chronically ill and having a disability um, is sometimes a full-time job for a lot of people in addition to other commitments that we have. So that would probably be one of the large reasons um, simply because it's not sustainable for us financially. So if you're not able to provide um, financial incentive, incentives, other incentives might be in whatever, in, what, in some way um, might be a solution just to make people feel like, I guess, legitimize in, in, in what they're sharing and that their expertise matters and not in the sense that you are implying that it doesn't, but also it's really difficult to have a lot of, um, I guess, onus put on us to share our lived experience and it not be um, monetarily or remunerated in an incentivized supportive way so that we feel that it's not just um, that emotion. Ugh, what am I trying to say? And the word is not coming out of my brain. Um, like the, the uh, what is it? Emo like, we're putting all of our energy into this um, without feeling like it's valued or supported in a different level other than it'll make a difference because making a difference doesn't always pay the bills, unfortunately, um, as much as we wish it did. Um, emotional labour. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, yes, so that's what I meant. Um, so I don't, yeah, other incentives might be something that you could ask your participants that they could benefit from. So if they are like university students, maybe giving them a reference for future employment or something um, so that they feel that um, even though they're giving their emotional labor, they're also receiving something in return to, to feel valued because not everybody does something for the sake of getting something in return, but just that value and that emotional labor can be quite tiresome, particularly if you're sharing vulnerable parts of yourself. Yeah, I'd also add to that too. Um, if you have got a group that you feel like is becoming a bit disengaged, don't be scared to have the conversation with them really honestly around why are they feeling disengaged? What is it exactly? that is a barrier or a challenge for them in their engagement? Are they bored or do they feel like that they're not adding any value? So invite the conversation as well. So have co-design about your co-design. <laughs> have the conversations and see why people are ditching out because quite often people won't volunteer that information up. But when you ask, they're quite happy to share around that as well. Yeah, check in with your participants. Um, make sure that you are, if you, for example, are talking about heavy topics such as violence, that you actually have resources in situations where those people might need support as a result of what they shared. Um, and that's really crucial because you wouldn't, I mean, inadvertently want to trigger something that was obviously not intentional but could lead to um, I guess negative repercussions um, but also just yeah just review and check in on your participants and make sure that, that they're doing okay and they feel safe with whatever they are involved in um, yeah and also make sure that participants you learn about the participants and they connect with one another as well because obviously we're all human and um, that connection um, is really important and having that community can really make a difference to engaging and making sure that people feel supported to being to continue being involved. Mm, Aki, I just add to that it's such a good point too that both you and Tess are making about you know being prepared um, for any type of co-design process where you know trauma might happen or be re-triggered and making sure that you have a wellbeing support officer available or you know as you said you have all the resources available to refer someone if you yourself can't provide them immediate support because 
As Aki so wonderfully explained, during co-design, it can often be the first time a person with disability feels they can openly and honestly share their true experience of something like violence. Um, and it's a real privilege to be in an organisation where, you know, you are there with that person sharing that experience for the first time, but it means that we have a responsibility um, to be prepared for that and to be able to support and refer that person on. Um, <clears throat> since there's a silence, we might start to wrap up because we are already over time. So yeah, thank you everyone for coming. Um, Tess, I'll just get you to move to the next slide. Um, yeah, we really would encourage you to go and have a look at the website. So our site.wwda.org.au. Um, you could visit the contribute page and give us feedback if there's anything that you think we're missing, or even if you just want to tell us it's a great website, which you obviously don't have to. Um, or, you know, you can tell us things that aren't good about it. We always are taking feedback. Um, visit the about page and download the our site final report. So that report contains a lot of what we've spoken about today. It outlines the co-design processes that were used, has tips on co-design and answers lots of questions about um, co-design, keeping people engaged, the importance of paying people, lots of those things that we've talked about, but in kind of more detail. Um, and follow us on social media if you don't already. So we are Women with Disabilities Australia on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Um, and we'll send all of this out via email. So anyone that did register, you will get an email with all of this information, plus the recording, um, the outside report and links to our various social media pages in case you do want to follow us. Um, yeah, thank you for joining. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Take care. Thanks, everyone. I hope for everyone who it's very late at night, you can now go and have a very good sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for staying up late if you did. Take care, everyone. Bye. Oh, well, someone did join from New York. It's amazing. Aki, what's your pup's name? Well, this is Chopper, uh, not mine, just dog sitting. <laughs> I was going to say, did you get another one, Aki? No, this is yeah. Billy. <laughs> oh, mine looks just like that one. I kicked her out because I knew she'd make a noise. Oh, the they, needed, so they needed to be. I put her out of the lounge. Before we no, I've still got Ponyo and Jojo, just I, I dog sit. <laughs> so I have lots of, I got like four, five right now just at my feet. Um, this is Sizzle. Sizzle. Oh, what a good name. Sizzle. Oh, good. Oh, Sizzle. Oh, my God. He's a pink one. This is Frank. Oh, my God. I need more. Hi, Frank. I've only got one. I need more. Um, and then, of course, you know Ponyo and Jojo. So they're just, yeah. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I love it. Aki, are you back in Australia now? I am, yes. <laughs> How was your flight back? How was the process getting home? Uh, it was um, it was good. Um, I've been back for not that long. I just mm. haven't left my house because COVID. Um, but yeah, no, it was fine. Um, yeah, it was actually just like the same as leaving. Sorry, yeah, the same as leaving. Um, you need a PCR test within. 72 hours of landing. Um, Singapore was really strict, more strict, um, but 